Cody, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. Uh, it's good to be back. <laughs> good, good. Well, I wanted to chat with you about this new concept you came up with. Well, you didn't come up with it recently, but you started talking about it recently, and that's DIY tenure. So before we get into that, could you explain what normal tenure is? Uh, sure. So the idea is that um, to maintain academic freedom and for people to potentially research unpopular ideas or things like that, a bunch of universities came up with this idea of tenure. And so professors would perform original research. And then after a certain period of time and sort of showing that they could do independent research and get grants and things like that, they would, at the university, they would be awarded tenure. And so that basically meant that they had a job for the rest of their life if, if they wanted it. And as long as they didn't do something egregious, uh, they, could, they could keep that job. And so it, it, it was just a way to make sure that intellectual freedom was, was able to be pursued. And, you know, and, and it could go against um, political ideologies of the time or whatever. And so, yeah, I, I think as an institution in general, I think, I think it's a good idea. Kind of switching over to the DIY tenure, the more recent versions of tenure within the American academic system are a little more constrained because a majority of the funding for different projects comes from uh, grant funding from the federal government or potentially uh, private industry as well. And but that, that's constrained in you know, what the funding agencies are actually willing to fund. And so my idea was sort of like, well, if you could come up with how the university actually grants someone tenure, then you could DIY it in some way. That's kind of the, the origins of uh, the idea of DIY, DIY tenure. But I've sort of been working on that for the past, I guess, eight or so years. Um, and only recently have I started actually thinking about it more and, and writing about it. Um, and so I posted a few things recently this year on the forum about it. Yeah, that's what, that's what caught my attention. So basically, ten, the original idea with tenure was academic and intellectual freedom. So after you'd gone through some process of proving that you had chops or whatever, then you couldn't be fired just because you were researching something that someone in the administration didn't approve of, essentially. Um, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. But but recently, there's, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that kind of goes along with it and some constraints. And you were kind of facing down that path and you worked up your own your own path which was essentially a form of, of diy tenure it sounds like so so what does di diy tenure look like for you right now like what projects and activities are you working on and how, how does that yeah like what does that look like uh yeah so um i'm still currently affiliated with with the university um, i'm still working on projects at the berkeley institute for data science uh, at uc berkeley so i was working on some fire projects there and some um, avalanche data projects for avalanche prediction. And then I'm also the communications manager. So doing scientific communications and doing scientific interviews, uh, illustrations, that sort of thing. And so that's my regular day job. Um, but I'm trying, my uh, contract for that is winding down in at the end of uh, June of this year. And so what I'm transitioning into is a completely DIY wide version of what I want to be doing, which is I'm creating an art studio gallery uh, with a friend. And then we're gonna be teaching classes through the gallery. So teaching um, just basic art classes, uh, nature and ecology classes and in relation to art. And then also taking clients out for uh, sort of weekend retreats. And so that's takes all of the interests that I have uh, with exploration and art and science and data and combines them into one thing. I'm also working on this Montology zine series uh, that I've talked about a little bit on the forum. And those are will be published quarterly. And those kind of came out of this idea that I had because I wrote this grant for National Geographic. And I didn't end up getting the grant, but I took those ideas and then now I'm making my first issue of the zine. I like implemented the ideas. I basically did the grant as if I got the money, but I did a much scaled down version 
of it uh, just for my own funds. And then uh, now I'm writing that up and going to publish a little uh, version, my own version of um, an issue of National Geographic. And so that will continue on as a, as a series. Uh, and that's focused on um, exploration and art and data, but sort of from my own perspective, not from a, a teaching perspective. What And what's the future of DIY tenure look like? Uh, for you? I mean, what are your goals and processes going going forward from this? Yeah, so I think a lot of us on the forum have been doing this sort of skillathon thing that we worked started working on together. So the idea with the skillathon is that each month of 2024, we would be focusing on a different set of skills that we would want to be learning. I have my idea of what I want to do uh, for the year that are related uh, to these small businesses and for this zine, and then also to like finish up my research projects and my communications projects. But then after that, looking forward to the next five years, I have a, a large list of different but overlapping topics that I'm interested in that I wanna pursue DIY master's degrees in. Mm -hmm. And so I'm figuring out, like going to different, um, different websites. So as an example, uh, a DIY science writing degree masters. Uh, I looked up a bunch of different degree standards. Uh, so examples are like MIT has a, a really nice science writing program. Mm -hmm. So I looked up their uh, curriculum and then sort of just des designed a similar curriculum. And then all the writing that I do for the Mintology zine series over the next few years is equivalent, I think, um, to the writing that you would be doing for a regular master's degree at MIT. So that's just one example. Um, but I come up, I came up with a bunch of, bunch of examples. That's so cool. Now, and now you're, you have a PhD in, in plant biology and your path here with DIY tenure has definitely come from that background of yours. Uh, do you think that DIY tenure is something that's only really possible or feasible for people who have PhDs, who've been to the upper levels of academia? Or do you think that it's a model that could be used for uh, normal people as well? I think it's open to whoever wants to pursue something like this. It, I mean, it's really just uh, a reframing of financial independence, retire early, mm. um, except minus the retire part, because, <laughs> well, I'm personally never going to retire and do nothing. I'm always going to be doing projects. And so, um, yeah, it's sort of along those same lines. So if you save up enough money uh, to then be able to do what you want, then you can create whatever projects you want from that. And so from that perspective, I think that it's relevant for whoever is interested in financial independence and, and trying to uh, work towards having independence in how, how you spend your time. But I think that the tenure portion might make more sense and be more relevant, I, I suppose, to uh, to an academic crowd because they they know what that means um, within the context of academia. Sure. So now, let's say someone was uh, watching or listening to this and they weren't that familiar with with Fire. Like, how are you? Like, you are generating an income, but how are you planning on being able to? continue to pursue your own interests and your own sort of tenure track into the realm of pursuits that may or may not generate a lot of money or, you know, like a full-time salary equivalent, like, how are you able to pull that off? I mean, I know that's a super deep topic, so you can just go like really sketch, <laughs> like really sketch it out there. One of the nice things about a tenure track position is that it's, it's, it's not just intellectual freedom, right? But it's job security. You've got that income coming in. So, so how are you able to do this without that sort of secure source of money flowing in? Uh, yeah. So, well, originally when I was researching how universities uh, generate the revenue to be able to uh, afford to pay professors tenure. So how that, how that works, and this is a simplification of course, but universities have endowments. The endowments are generated from past funds, past investments. They also take in cash donations from different alumni, those sorts of things to grow the endowment fund. And then the endowment fund, you can take a certain percentage off each year and the endowment fund will continue um, in perpetuity, hopefully. 
And so then that, that allows the university to have like a large bankroll to uh, then fund all of these positions yeah. over time. And so that's why there aren't that many positions because it's, you know, as wages rise, levels of expectations also rise with that. And so it, yeah. it becomes harder and harder to fund these sorts of positions. But the good news is, is that as an individual, if you're interested in something like that, you can read into investing, read into savings, read into frugality, and that sort of cluster of skills, you can build that up over time. And especially if you're following some of the principles that Jacob has outlined in his early retirement extreme book, you can retire extremely early, or you can get to that financial independence goal relatively early, or your DIY tenure <laughs> uh, goal relatively early. So to be clear, this isn't like I'm making the equivalent amount of money <laughs> right. uh, that, that, that a regular tenured professor at some large institution would be making, but it's more that I've pared down my interests and pared down my lifestyle enough that and live frugally enough just in general that you don't actually need that large of a uh, of an uh, of your own personal endowment uh, to to be able to do that. So sure. And if you if you if you're uh, comfortable sharing, how frugal are you? Like ballpark figure, like what's your cost of living? Yeah, so ballpark, uh, I've lived pretty much around twenty thousand dollars a year um, since grad school. So, so that's basically a grad student salary, at least when I was in grad school. And then as I moved to postdoc, and then went on to found a company, and then came back to academia, I was making more than twenty thousand dollars a year. And then you just save the difference. Right. Um, between how much you earn and, and how much you spend. That, cool. That's sort of the 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 general general ballpark. Yeah. I mean, I could I could be I could definitely be even more frugal if I needed to be, but I like doing adventure stuff and sometimes yeah. that's expensive. <laughs> well I was gonna say you're mountain frugal. And I mean just just for someone who, who maybe hasn't listened to um to our previous conversation, which I encourage they do, first of all, you 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 live in a beautiful town. You live right on the side edge of the mountains. You trail run every day you ride your mountain bikes you're always doing adventures you're spending times doing things that you're interested in with your diy tenure system you're spending quality time with your wife you've got you're involved in your community like your lifestyle is rich and robust and really really interesting and you don't spend a lot of money to do that so i just any chance i get i like to highlight that for people who might not have a lot of people that they know at very low levels of spending who are living like really rich and interesting fulfilling lives yeah I, I guess i would say that um yeah like during the pandemic as an example we hardly spent any money we just cook at home and then we were just inside right <laughs> um <laughs> yeah and so so yeah more recently i would say we spend a little more money by going out and you know doing things with within the community um, there are a lot of free activities within the community but also when you live in a small place uh it is somewhat community support to like support the local businesses um, and to like go get a coffee sometimes. Yeah. Know, go, out to, go out to eat occasionally. So we, we have no qualms about doing that because the people that we know are literally the servers there, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, and, so, and I've always been really inspired by your, your drink and draw event that you set up. Could you explain that? Mm -hmm. uh, sure, yeah. So um, my friend, Dustin and I, he's, uh, we got connected because we were both doing art related things. He's more traditional painting and I'm more illustration, uh, sketch note type things. Anyway, so we started getting together and and doing art once a week. And we started going to this bar and we would go every Thursday. And in fact, I'm gonna go after this call because nice. we're recording on a Thursday. Um, and so yes, yeah, we go to this bar, we would go to this bar on Thursdays and just have a beer, hang out together. And we're like, oh, actually, we're here and this is a cool place to hang out because people were asking what we were doing. We should just bring extra paper and some extra like spare pencils and then other people can draw with us. And then that sort of morphed into, well, now we have a monthly event where we actually do drink and draw. And so a lot, a lot of people come out from the community and I've met a lot of really interesting people, um, including this other artist in town. Um, I met him through his girlfriend who came to the drink and draw. And now he and I are 
business partners and we're opening the studio in the next town. And so it's sort of like, yeah, you have to be be out there and put yourself out there and then be open to meeting people. Um, and I think that that's probably a little easier in a small town than it is in a large city, although there are technically more people to meet. But here in the small town, it's it's potentially easier to meet people, especially if you have a niche interest. There's probably maybe one or two other people <laughs> who are also who are also interested in, in right. what you're interested in. And I mean, I I have to stop myself from going down the rabbit hole, but like the place you the 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 pub with the drink and draw, it's also a bike shop, and you're also doing part time work there, right? And you're learning uh, bike suspension and things like that. Like your interests are just like roots in that community, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And the the owner, um, he, he and I just became friends and and friendly together, and uh, we were talking on the forum about what would you do if you were zeroed out or like all of your money was zeroed out, like what would you do? Yeah. And I think what I would do is I would, I was like, well, I would just go to the bike shop and ask for a job and use my relatively minimal <laughs> uh, bike skills that I had just from working on road bikes when I was, and, and I guess mountain bikes too, when I was racing in college and use that in order to be able to get a job. And I was like, well, I should probably just do that anyway. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I started spending um, a few hours every weekend working in the shop and uh, just working on my own bikes and then working on customers' bikes, doing like simple repairs. And then the shop owner would double check my work. And then that led to me taking this bike repair uh, professional level class at United Bicycle Institute. I took that this past fall. Um, and so now I'm a certified bike mechanic. And um, with that, I'm moving towards specializing in suspensions. Hmm. And the reason for that is because there aren't as many local folks who can do that type of work. There's a number of people who do more simple repairs, which is which is fine. But I want to be on the like higher, more specialized end of things. And suspensions are really cool. Um, <laughs> and so, so yeah, so I'm moving towards that direction. So working in the shop a little bit here and there. And then uh, the spring, I'm taking some more advanced classes that are just focusing on suspension and uh, mm -hmm. disc brakes. One of the things that, or one of the responsibilities I should say in, uh, as like a tenure professor, whatever, would be uh, teaching, right? And mentoring grad students and that sort of thing. And so someone might criticize the DIY tenure idea saying that like, well, how are you giving back in terms of teaching, mentoring, if, if that's an interest? For someone so do you have any thoughts on that uh yeah I, I mean i think that with the with the art studio that we're putting together we're going to have classes and um with that i'm going to be teaching classes i'm going to be teaching both nature-based classes nature journaling um, along with with art and i think that i could combine them in a unique way and keep it engaging for people so whether or not they're you know maybe they just show up for the science portion of the class or maybe they just show up for the art portion, but they're going to be sort of integrated. Mm. And um, so that's not the same thing, I suppose, as teaching graduate students and you know mentoring people that are getting PhDs. But I think that it still applies. You could still mentor people for helping them develop their curiosities and develop questions about the world and use the scientific method in order to be able to do that. And that's regardless of whether or not they're in a u university, you can still use those those techniques. Now, whether or not they're going to do, you know, groundbreaking work in the field, like that probably doesn't matter. But right. also, like, there are a lot of new species discoveries uh, from curious amateurs, mm. um, especially over the over the over the West in these like little sky island pockets where they're like higher elevation, underexplored. There's probably some species that are up there that are the term is called endemic, so they're only found in in that little area. Hmm. And I think that the the more that we explore uh, these different these different ranges and these uh, different areas, you know, people could discover something new. So whether or not that is <laughs> groundbreaking depends on uh, what perspective you come from, I guess. But yeah, yeah, sure. Well, it seems like if your burning passion goal is to be pushing the edge of academic discovery research, 
maybe maybe a university is the right place to be, particularly if what you're doing involves instruments and laboratories and infrastructure and capital and things like that. Yeah, but, certainly. Um, the, the the claim here isn't that like, oh, you want to be an experimental physicist? That's fine. You can DIY it. It's like, well, you might not be able to get your hands on the <laughs> apparatus you need just by uh, living like a grad student. You maybe can't buy a collider or whatever experimental physicists use. I don't know. But yeah. for, for everyone yeah. else, there's DIY tenure. Yeah. And, and so, but but I think that you could still um, more uh, theoretical fields uh, or fields that involve writing simulations or really just combining fields. That's also a, a contribution to the to the knowledge that we have as humans. For, from from my perspective, I sort of think, well, I might discover something by ex experimenting with all of these different things that I'm interested in but I'm not pushing towards any one individual discovery, but I am documenting it. And so if people want to follow this path or be inspired by it or whatever for their own potential explorations, then I think that's the best we could hope for. Well, what you just said makes me think of Jacob's uh, second YouTube video on the STOA, his second STOA presentation, which was about um, uh, bridging the gaps between fields of experts who when you're a hyper-specialized expert, it's difficult to even communicate with an expert from another field because you lack the sort of same mental models to be able to, to talk. And so there's there are interactions between these fields in the real world that a lot of experts don't understand because few experts are experts in those gaps in between the fields. And, and so a multidisciplinary or an interdisciplinary Renaissance man approach is is, is kind of what he was uh, promoting there. Well, awesome, Cody, thanks for coming on and thanks for talking about DIY tenure. And I'm gonna post links to everything so people can find your stuff and, and follow your thoughts as they develop on DIY tenure. But uh, on that, great talking again. Yeah, great to talk to you, Tyler. See you. Cheers.